All right, thank you, preacher, for letting me come, and I certainly enjoyed the Jeremiah Hart family. They come to our place every year on Bible Day, and we have a good time there with that, and, and uh, they just just good, just spirit filled, touches my heart, messes me up, and then you gotta try to get up and preach after all that. It's good, you know. Um, 32 years ago, we moved our little family to El Dorado, Arkansas, and um, I was born in San Antonio. My wife was born in Fort Worth at Harris Hospital, and you know we're Texans through and through. And I think my dad thought that I maybe would follow him at his church, and it just the Lord had other plans. You know how that goes. I had an aunt who was a nurse in El Dorado, Arkansas, and through going out and visiting her, um, I got burdened about going there. And um, you know, I'd never heard I'd heard preachers preach against. Preachers correct in the Bible, and I never heard anybody do that. And I went to a Southern Baptist church that my aunt was a member of and, and um, heard a preacher get up and start saying, better render this and better render that. And I thought, well, that's not right. He's not letting the Bible say what the Bible says, you know. And, and um, anyway, through that and seeing the kids on the street, I, uh, El Dorado is a town of about 18,000 people now. It was 26,000 when I moved there 32 years ago. So it's, it's a small town, but... Through going there and visiting my aunt, I got burdened. I got back to Texas, and I couldn't get Arkansas off my mind. And so we loaded up our family in the process of time. And we started in our home with 14 people. I tell people we started from scratch, and we're still scratching. And uh, it's a blessing. But, you know, I love the bus kids, and uh, we started a bus ministry. And Martha here, wave at me, Martha. Martha was nine years old, and she started riding a blue bus to Bible Baptist. Some of our bus workers were out knocking doors in the Wildwood Trailer Park. And Martha couldn't speak English very good at that time. And, and uh, she'd just come over from Mexico where her grandparents lived. Her mom had come over to find work and all of that. And she came, kind of caught up with her mom. And, and anyway, uh, she started riding the bus, and she learned English very quickly. And in the process of time, Martha got saved. I'm so glad Martha got saved by the grace of God. It's a blessing. And Martha, every year someone would pay her way to go to youth camp. You know, we have people in the church and people in the community that give money to sponsor bus kids to camp. And Martha went to camp year after year. And uh, Martha didn't, wasn't ever privileged to go to our Christian school, but she was a really good athlete. She played uh, basketball and softball at a little school Norfolk's kind of back maybe a mile or two, a couple miles from our church, and she was a good athlete. And Anyway, uh, football's real big in the South, and, and Martha made the homecoming court, and she was one of the young ladies, you know, and all. And, and anyway, Martha asked me, she said, um, Brother J.D., would you, would you be my escort at homecoming? And uh, I said, Martha, what about your stepdad? And she said, I want, I want my pastor to be my escort. Amen. All the other girls had their dads, you know, and we were spread out across the football field. Every 10 yards, there was a dad and a daughter and a dad and a daughter. And came time for me and Martha. We kind of closed in. It came our time. And we're walking across the field to the, the bleachers are packed out across the way. And, and they began to talk about Martha's accomplishments and she's an honor student and so forth and all the things that she'd accomplished in school and oh I was so proud as a preacher on my little bus kids I wanted a pastor to be her escort well that's a highlight she went to Bible college for one year met her husband Jason what a blessing and uh, they got married, and, and uh, Martha's little sister would come, Brenda would come, and Brenda was just a little old baby, and uh, riding the blue bus, and Martha was taking care of Brenda. And Martha's mama made me hundreds of tortillas. I mean, like, like stacks of homemade tortillas. And there was a time that I was the fastest growing pastor in Arkansas. <laughs> Amen, and I was eating all them tortillas. It didn't matter what we were having, amen. I was eating tortillas. If we had roast, I'd just use roast on a tortilla. And uh, Martha's mama uh, did that, and she, I know she appreciated us taking the kids to church and everything. But, you know, Martha graduated, and, and they moved off, got married, moved off, and began to have their children. They've got the three children, and what a blessing. And, 
And uh, of course, Brenda's got her fiance, Dylan, here. And appreciate you coming, Dylan. I do appreciate all of you coming. It's a blessing to me. And, um, but anyway, time went on, and Martha's on our mailing list. And you know, every year at youth camp time, we try to put in the letter, hey, if you want to sponsor a kid to camp, you know, we just kind of throw it out there, and some do, and, and all of that. Well, anyway, we started getting checks in the mail from, from Martha every year. And uh, she's kind of giving back so other little bus kids could get there. Isn't that a blessing? Yeah. And I uh, appreciate y'all doing that. I really do. It's a blessing and all. And ain't God good to give us so many blessings. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And uh, thank y'all for letting me come. And I, I left church last night. It probably wasn't the smartest thing I've ever done, but... Um, we preachers do some crazy things, and I, I'd been gone. I was actually out of my church last Sunday. I was preaching a missions conference in Missouri City, Texas, and and anyway, you know, kind of felt the pressure of, of needing to be in the pulpit, if you know what I mean, and because I'd been gone, and so I uh, preached Sunday morning and then Sunday night. Well, I took a nap Sunday afternoon, yesterday afternoon, and I thought, I'm going to leave after church tonight, and, and I was all packed up, ready to go. Our service starts at 6, and so... We was out, you know, a little after seven or whatever, and so I got, got in my car and took off, and I drove all the way to Weatherford, Texas, and uh, man, I was tired. Got got in about one something in the morning, but I wanted to get through the Metroplex. That's called wisdom, yeah. you know. And so uh, I stopped at the Bucky's on the other side of Dallas, and, uh, and then I got me a cup of coffee and I made it to uh, to, and I jewed the guy down at the motel. I didn't have reservations or not. And I, I told him I was a poor Baptist preacher and half the night was over with. And man, he come on down, Brother JT, it's good. I'm, I tell him I'm not Jewish, but I like to get the best deal I can, you know. And uh, But anyway, uh, so I slept in a little bit this morning and then got on my horse and rode on over here this afternoon. Amen, it's a blessing. It took me another little nap so I wouldn't go to sleep in church tonight since I'm the one doing the preaching, okay. But anyway, uh, this is the time when preachers are tired, they usually have bloopers. How many preachers know what I'm talking about? Them bloopers, amen. You can have a blooper every once in a while when you get real tired and everything. So if I have a blooper, amen, y'all just forgive me, amen. But uh, they say you can always tell a Texan. You just can't tell him much, amen. So anyway, all right. When I was a little boy, my mom and dad were having problems in their marriage. And they'd been through confirmation and catechism and uh, were lost, unchurched adults, empty on the inside, and they were having problems in their marriage, and so they decided that they'd try to get back in church as adults, and they went back to those churches that they grew up in, and they didn't find what they were looking for. And we lived about a block and a half from an old-fashioned, fundamental, independent, Bible-believing Baptist church. I mean a strong church, strong King James, Bible-believing, Bible-thumping. I mean, it was a great church. Had a 1,000-seat auditorium, Brother Graham. Had 800 on the bottom floor, 200 in the balcony. It was a great church. Ran about 700 people. The Weesatch Avenue Baptist Church in San Antonio, Texas. My dad was a state trooper. I love my dad. And my dad was a good man, but my dad was lost. He... He'd get his ice chest full of beer on Sundays and go out bass fishing on Sundays and, and uh, drink the beer and fill the ice chest up with fish was kind of what the plan was, I think. But the last Sunday in August 1966, I was just a little redhead boy, a little six-year-old boy. I was born in 1960. And my dad and mom walked into that church and they had a door back in the back and then they had a door up here and they kind of sat in the middle and my dad told my mom, he said, honey, if anybody messes with me, he said, I'm out of here. He said, I've heard about these Baptists. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the old man of God, Dr. Claude Bonham Sr., he wasn't real tall in stature, but he took the, the word of God. He preached the gospel that day. I'm just a little boy, and I looked over at my dad, and tears were running down his cheeks, and I'd never seen my daddy cry. He my he big old state trooper, you know, and I, I was wondering what was wrong with him. It wasn't what was wrong with him. The Holy Ghost of God got a hold of his heart. And he realized for the first time in his life that he was lost. And he realized if he died like he was, he wasn't going to heaven, he's going to hell. When the invitation was given, my dad looked at my mom. He said, honey, I don't know about you, but this is what I need. 
My dad bailed out. My mama came with him down to the old-fashioned altar. An old man of God stepped down and he took the word of God. He said, what'd you come for? My dad said, I just need to be saved. He took the word of God and led my mom and daddy to Jesus Christ. And God gave me a new mama and God gave me a new daddy and it changed our family forever. Changed our family. All those long neck Lone Stars in the refrigerator door had to go down the double sink in San Antonio, Texas. My dad gave his life to Jesus, amen. I'm telling you, he changed. I saw the change in my dad's life. I remember how he used to be and all that, and the things he used to do, and then he wasn't the same person no more. He's a new creature in Christ, and old things were passed away. Behold, all things were become new. And God gave me a new mama, and God gave me a new daddy. I was real shy and real timid. I had a lot of little issues. I was real clingy to my mama, real clingy. When the kindergarten bus would come, I'd run hide in the bushes. I didn't want to leave my mama. I was a little bedwetter. We got any little bed? No, never mind. I had, I told you we might have a blooper or two tonight. Or three. When I was a little boy, my first grade Sunday school teacher, her name was Mrs. Griffin Jones. And Mrs. Griffin Jones loved me. Are you listening to me? She loved me. She loved all the little boys and girls that came through her class. Back in those days, they had what they call flannel graph. And they put the pictures up on a flannel graph board and she taught from an open Bible. She knew the Bible story inside and outside. And she just taught us the Word of God. Just taught the Word of God from her heart. She challenged us and she said, boys and girls, if you'll learn the books of the Bible, I'll take you all to the San Antonio Zoo and in the middle of the San Antonio Zoo is this place called Monkey Island. Well, man, I'm a little boy, you know, little old skinny arms and everything. And I thought to myself, wow, that'd be awesome to go to the San Antonio Zoo and, and see all them monkeys. And I wasn't very smart. I really wasn't very smart. I'm not very smart. My brother Bob, he's an educator and uh, he's a straight A student. I was an outstanding student. I was always outstanding in the hall. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was a little knucklehead, amen. Oh, I got in so much trouble. Hard to believe. But my mama worked with me, and I learned the books of the Bible as a little boy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. I know the New Testament too. I know it a bunch of different ways. Here's one of the ways. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, Romans, 2, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, yes. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st Peter, 2nd Peter, 3 John's, Jude, and Revelation. Amen. I learned this little pledge when I was a little boy. It goes like this, I promise God, helping me not to buy, drink, sell, or give alcoholic liquors while I live. From all tobacco, I'll abstain and never take God's name in vain. Amen. Wow. Amen. I was just like a little sponge learning all them. Every, every week I learned a memory verse. And every Sunday I'd have my, my, my blue jeans on. I rolled them up in, in, at the bottom. Back in those days, they was long, and I'd roll them up at the bottom and had a big old Texas belt buckle on. Somebody say amen right there. Everything's big in Texas, amen. Had that big old Texas belt buckle, and uh, I had one of them snap, I used to wear them snap western shirts like my grandpa wore, them snaps, had three snaps on the sleeve. How many of y'all remember what I'm talking about? You gotta be kinda old now. Yeah, them snap, man. And I had my King James Bible and my offering envelope. Brother Graham, I always had my offering envelope. And man, I wanted to give something in every category. I mean, I was giving to the building fund and the missions and the tithe. I might have had a quarter, but I put a nickel in every category, amen? I was big time, big time, man. I just love Jesus, amen, it's a blessing. 
My first grade Sunday school teacher for my seventh birthday, she bought me a set, Brother JT, she bought me a set of Mexican bullhorns. Man, I mean, I, I'm talking about like longhorn, like I had my own set, I was big time, had them on my dresser, bullhorns. For my next birthday, she bought me a Mexican bullwhip. It's braided, you know, black and white, and I learned how to pop that sucker. My brother Bob is five years older than me, and I made him cry, and I, they had to take that thing away from me. You know? <laughs> I got in trouble. I got in trouble. But I tell you, I grew up, I grew up around the things of God, and I love Jesus tonight, and I love y'all, and thank y'all for letting me come. And it would be in my heart to try to help you tonight. And I, I didn't really know exactly what it was going to do, but I'm gonna, actually going to do what the message has been kind of done a lot over the years, but it'll be a blessing to your heart tonight. We just pray the Lord to honor it, and I believe it's the message that he would have me preach tonight. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2. And I do hope you'll come back in the morning, and just a great lineup of preachers here. And uh, all these preachers are my buddies, and I love them all, and thank God for them. And, and uh, I know they've been a real help and a blessing and all that. And so, anyway, I even love the walkers, amen. And uh, I love the walkers. They're a blessing. They're going to be with us in May, and we're excited about that on Mother's Day. It's hard for evangelists to maybe get meeting sometime on Mother's Day, but we're going we're gonna to have a, a good time on Mother's Day. What a blessing. I do have a wife. She didn't get to come with me, and we've been married almost 44 years. Her name is Deanna, and uh, we have four children, uh, Joe, Janine, Jake, and Jenna. I thought about renaming her. We got, I'm J.D., and her Joe's my name, so, but she's the only one that ain't got a J. But here's our family. We've multiplied in, in replenishing the earth. Uh, single-handed, amen, and uh, we've got 13 grandbabies and, and one great-grandbaby, and God's been good, amen, he's increased our tribe, and as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, amen, it's a blessing. Luke chapter number two, when I think of Luke chapter number two, I always think of the Christmas story, and uh, Luke chapter two, verse number seven, the Bible says, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the, in the inn, Verse number 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Verse 14 says, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward, toward men. Verse number 20, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And so we have the birth of Jesus Christ in, in the context of the scriptures here. Verse 21 says, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. What a blessing. Isn't that a blessing? I just like to say the name Jesus. Isn't that a blessing? Just say Jesus. Amen. It's good, isn't it? Jesus. Yeah, I love it. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And he's just the same as his lovely name. And that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Amen. Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is, uh, is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves. And so it was the custom of the, the, Jew, the Jews to bring their little boy babies in and have them circumcised. And uh, what a blessing. And uh, Jesus was brought in. And, and look at verse number 25. The Bible says, And behold, behold is a stop, look, and listen word. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now this is a great compliment right here, a great compliment. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. Boy, that's a blessing, isn't it? When, God, when somebody can say about you, the Holy Ghost is upon him, that's a, that's a tremendous compliment for anybody. Verse 25, And it was revealed unto him, unto Simeon, by the Holy Ghost, that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him, after the custom of the law, to have him circumcised, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and sang. So Simeon's now holding Jesus now as a, as a little baby or a little boy in his arms, and he's just blessing God, amen, and said, Lord, now lettest thou uh, thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Watch this now. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. 
You know, we see through a glass darkly, but the songwriter said, face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Boy, that's gonna be, I can't wait for that day, amen, to see him face to face. He said in verse 30, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Watch this now. Verse 31, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. I've got that little all circle in my Bible which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. A light to lighten the Gentiles. Aren't you glad we serve a whosoever will God? Man, God's not willing that any, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. He loves everybody and he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Look now at verse number 36, 37, 38. This will be our text verses tonight. The Bible says there in verse 36, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel. You know how they have different name, uh, names have different meanings in the Bible. Anna's name means grace or favor. Grace or favor. Phanuel, her dad, uh, his name means face of God. Face of God. Phanuel means face of God. And boy, that's a blessing, isn't it? And uh, I hear my dad tell me, look, look at me, son. Look, look at me. Look me in the eye. Look at me. Yeah, oh yeah, he, want your, he wanted eye contact. He didn't want you looking down when it's time to get a whooping. He wanted, he wanted you to know he meant business. Yeah. yeah. There was one Anna, prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple but serve God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she, Anna, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord. Remember that Simeon's there with, with, with Jesus as a little boy and Anna comes in and she's giving thanks to the Lord as well. Isn't that a blessing? And spake of him, when Anna puts her eyes on Jesus, wow, it says, and spake of him, to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Can I tell you tonight, all over Midland, all over this area, West Texas, there are people that are looking for something. And a lot of them are looking in all the wrong places. And I don't have to tell you about that. Some are looking uh, in a bottle and looking to alcohol. One of our bus kids named Stephan. I love Stephan. He's a big old boy, but Started riding the bus when he was eight years old. He never was a little boy, but he's a, he's a hoss. He's about 17 years old now, but his mama died about three years ago, two years ago. And uh, his daddy worked in the oil field. And Stephen's dad just got overwhelmed when he lost his wife. And instead of turning to God, he turned to the bottle. I was taking Stephen home the other night, a couple weeks ago on Sunday night. And he said, preacher, he said, my daddy used to talk to me. Every day my daddy would talk to me. Every day my daddy would talk to me. He said, I hadn't seen him now in over two years. That's what alcohol does, folks, I'm telling you. We, he's off the grid now. We don't even know where he's at. I don't know if he's dead or alive. We don't know. But I told Stephan, I said, Stephan, we love you, buddy. I'm telling you, if anything ever happens, you need a place to stay, we got you. I mean, we got your back. We're gonna, we'll take care of you. We love you. And I'm telling you, that's what alcohol does. And there's people looking at all the, the wrong places. My friend, Brother Mark Haynes and Joel Haynes out there on the Indian Reservation. Brother Haynes was in that missions conference. Brother Mark was last week that I was in. I love Brother Haynes. We've supported both of them for years and, and watched Joel grow up. And he's a tremendous preacher and we love him. And thank God for that ministry out there. They've started at least 10 churches now uh, out there on the reservation. Navajos reaching Navajos. But I remember Brother Mark Haynes saying one time, he said, preacher, Indians get drunk in the wintertime and they wander out and they get away and, and they just get lost. And he said there's more people die out there on the reservation of hypothermia. They freeze to death. They just lose their way and they don't, you know, nobody finds them until it's too late. Boy, that'd be a terrible way to die, wouldn't it? How many of y'all know what I'm talking about, the effects of alcohol? You've seen it in your own family or friends. Raise your hand right there. Young people, you better look around. I'm telling you, it destroys families. It destroys lives. But Anna, she was looking for those that were looking for Jesus. And I'll tell you, there's people that are lost and they don't even know where they're, what they're looking for, but we got the answer. Christ is the answer. Amen. Say that with me. Christ is the answer. Say it again. Christ is the answer. 
Yeah, amen. I don't care what your problem is. He's the answer. Now, the story tonight, the message, the title of the message is Tear Up the Script. And I want to say some things about Anna very quickly. Anna was totally committed to God. And Anna was a good lady. And ladies in the Bible, Miss Loretta's a lady speaker, but ladies in the Bible are either really, really good or they're really, really bad. Are, are you listening to me? They're either really good ladies or they're just wicked heifers. Yeah, they're bad. They're bad women. They're bad. Bad. Are y'all with me? And Anna was a really good lady. She was a really good lady. Now look at this now. Anna was totally committed to God. She was consecrated to God. Uh, Anna was a prayer warrior. It says, um, serve God with fastings and prayers. Night and day. Boy, that's a blessing, isn't it? What a testimony. Anna was always ready to testify of the saving blood of Jesus Christ. She was looking for those that were looking for redemption in Jerusalem. I mean, Anna was ready to serve God. She was ready. She attended to the Lord without distraction. Anna made a voluntary offering of herself to God. She presented her body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, and that was her reasonable service. That was the least she could do for the Lord in light of all that he'd done for her. Wow. But something happened in Anna's life. Ladies, after only seven years of marriage, and Anna's husband died. Now, I've been married 44 years, and I don't think that when Anna got married, preacher, I don't, the Bible doesn't really speak to it, but I don't think they sat, you know, there, you know, on their honeymoon, and Anna said, you know, honey, you're probably only going to live about seven years, and you're going to kick the bucket. No, I don't think she knew. Are you listening to me? I don't think it was in her script. It wasn't in Anna's script that her husband would die after only seven years of marriage. I have another piece of paper here, and it says God's script. Let me ask you this, did God know that Anna's husband would die after only seven years of marriage? Sure he did, God's omniscient isn't he, he's all knowing. Did God allow her husband to die after only seven years of marriage? Yeah, I mean listen, hey, uh, God's in control of everything, isn't he? He's in control of life and death, his ways are above our ways and the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. There's just some things we might not understand or we might not know the whys of it, but God is in control and he knows. And so the title of the message tonight is Tear Up the Script. Everybody look at me. So I think Anna had to get her script out after her husband died. And she had to tear her script up. And that's what the message is tonight, Tear Up the Script. Now listen to me. I'm very proud of Anna. You know, I know we've given some hands tonight, but we could clap and give a hand to Anna because Anna got it right. Instead of allowing her circumstances to make her bitter, She tore her script up and accepted what God allowed to happen. Are are you with me? She accepted what God allowed to happen. So instead of allowing her circumstances to make her bitter, she allowed her circumstances to make her better. And so instead of, to, to me ladies, Miss Loretta, I don't know if I'm right or not, but it just seems like she took the love that she had for her hubby for her husband, and she took that love that she had this way, and she directed it this way. She took the love she had for her her husband, she directed it to God. Instead of getting bitter and blaming God, no, she served God night and day with fastings and prayer, and she departed not from the temple. If anything was going on down at the temple, guess who was there? Anna was. Man, when she got to see Jesus, wow, with her physical eyes, then she started telling everybody that was looking for redemption about the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, that's a good pattern, isn't it? You ladies that like to sew, that's a good pattern. Anna was a good pattern uh, for ladies to follow, wasn't she? Wow. Tear up the script. I have another piece of paper here. And uh, you'll get this message real quick, and then we'll, we'll wrap her up, but... This says Joseph's script. I promise you that when Joseph went to check on his brothers, he had no idea what was going to go down that day. Are are you listening to me? He had no way of knowing that his very own brothers were going to cast him into a pit. 
Are, are you listening to me? Wow. And I know they envied him and I know that they hated his guts because of that coat of many colors and, and all of that. But I'm going to tell you something. His brothers were losers. Everybody look at me. His brothers were losers. You study their lives and those guys were wicked. They were wrong. Oh, Joseph had to get his script out. Did God allow all that to happen? Yes, he did. He was sold them Midianite merchant men. Remember that? Wound up down there in Potiphar's house. And Well, I love that little statement in Genesis 39 where it says, and the Lord was with Joseph. Amen. Would you say that with me? And the Lord was with Joseph. Say it again. And the Lord was with Joseph. Say it again. And the Lord was with Joseph. Wow, wow, wow. I don't mean to be derogatory, but Potiphar's wife was a wicked heifer. I kind of feel like Potiphar's wife, you know, she just, she didn't beat around the bush, but JT, she said, lie with me. She is a married woman. And man, Joseph was not going to, you know, sin against his master, but he knew he was, it would be a sin against God. And man, you know, he left his coat and kept his character and all that. But I believe, man, she pressed him day by day. And I just believe, ladies, I don't know, I might be speaking out of turn a little bit, but I think she probably had a lot of makeup on. I believe she had that eye stuff on, and I think it was kind of sticking together like a lot of makeup. And I kind of preach it like this, that it was like, hey, Josie, baby. You know? And, you know, she thought she was the cat's meow and all that stuff. She wasn't all that. No, she's a married woman. She was a loser. That lady was wicked. That lady was wicked. And man, I'm proud of Joseph. We could give Joseph a hand tonight. But I'm telling you, listen, Joseph stuck with God. Man, he's interpreting dreams. And, and next thing you know, man, he's the governor of the land. Man, Joseph's got the keys to the corn crib. Man, he's got the keys. To, I mean, nobody buys corn without going through Joseph. It's an unbelievable story. And wow. You read the rest of the story, he even provides uh, coats for his brothers at the end of it all. Wow. Wow. Wow, but oh Joseph, just a lot of things happened in his life. It wasn't in his script. I can tell you, he had to get his script out and tear it up. I got another one here. This is, I'm going to change this one. I'm going to put my script on this one. My script. And you know, we could, we could preach a series about you know, people in the Bible, we could talk about Job. and Well, one day sure changed his life, didn't he? Seven sons and three daughters he lost. And man, lost everything, didn't he? One day, man, one doctor's visit, one phone call changed your life for the rest of your life. Are you with me? Things happen, don't they? Things happen in our script that we had no idea was going to happen. My wife and I, we grew up around farming, and I, I got to show you all my milking muscle. I was going to be a dairy farmer, amen, and, and uh, this is my first trip here. These pastors, they've all seen the milk and muscle. You don't remember nothing else, you remember the milk and muscle. So my brother Bob bought me a baby calf when I was 14 years old, and her name was Jenny, and I raised Jenny up on a bottle, and anyway, I got in the cattle business, and man, I had, um, you know, my dad, we had an old church bus, and it shelled the motor on it. It's kind of a funny story, but old church bus, and the motor was shelled, and uh, it was back in the woods, and we lived next door to the church, and I asked my dad, I said, Dad, can I have that uh, church bus? Can I use it? And it was gone, man. It was back in the woods. We were hiding it. But people couldn't see it. His eyes sore. He said, what do you want to use it for? I said, I want to raise baby calves in there. I want to raise baby calves in that church bus. And he said, yeah. Oh, well, youth pastor said, uh, building boys is better than mending men. Yeah, that's a good statement. Building boys is better than men than men. And my dad let me use that old church bus, and I sectioned it off with bales of hay. And uh, I had the little baby Holstein heifers and little black and white Holstein little dairy heifers, and I, I had that bus full of them. I was running a bus for, you know, before I even knew what a bus kid was, amen. But anyway, we had that bus, and, and I had it full of calves, and I'd take racks of bottles down, and I'd feed them. They'd be bawling. They'd be crying, wanting me to get them their milk and all of that, and I'd have to clean up after them and let the windows down for ventilation and all that. I called that church bus, I called it my cafeteria. <laughs> yeah, my cafeteria. Amen. We had a revival meeting, and an old-timey evangelist by the name of Dr. Joe Boyd came, and man, old Dr. Joe Boyd, he is big and tall, and, and he came to our church year after year and 
way back in the day, and Dennis Coral and and um, Oliver Raisin, some of those guys travel with him. He'd have groups of preacher boys, and they'd go out soul winning and all that stuff. And anyway, I had Brother Boyd down at my revi- uh, down at our house during the revival. Back in those days, they'd take the evangelists home, and feed them in different homes in the church. You'd have a sign up sheet, and they'd take them out to eat. Man, they'd, different families in the church would feed the preacher and, and the evangelist. And so, man, I was so excited. We lived in Mansfield, Texas. 209 Sycamore Street, just a little frame house there. And I was so excited because all American, all, Joe Boyd was, I mean, he was like a hoss at Texas A&M. I mean, he's a tremendous athlete. You can look him up. And uh, he could have played professional football and all that. And I mean, tremendous athlete, big old boy. And anyway, he didn't go into ministry. He, he, I mean, he didn't go into football. He, he went after the Lord. And God used him in a great way. So I, he, he was an All-American at Texas A&M. And I was so excited to have all American Joe Boyd. He's white-headed. He's probably 80-plus years old. Brother Graham, he's there at my house, and my wife is in the kitchen. And uh, she, my wife knows how to cut up a whole chicken and, you know, the different pieces and all that. And I didn't marry a microwave mama, amen. I married a cook. And so anyway, uh, she's frying up that chicken, had it all ready, and the rolls was in the oven, the macaroni and cheese and the baked beans and all that. Well, anyway, I'm talking to Brother Boyd. My dad's in the kitchen talking to my wife, and I'm in, in the living room, our little living room, and and uh, I still had some trophies out from high school, you know, from those days when I played ball. And, and Brother Boyd said, uh, what's your name now? And, and I said, J.D. And he said, what's your given name? What's your initials stand for? And I said, uh, Joe, Joe Dalton. I said, I was named after both my grandfathers. One was named Joe, and the other one was named Dalton. We just kind of split it down the middle. They've called me J.D. my whole life. You know, Dr. Boyd, I don't know if he's hard of hearing or what, but he just started calling me David. <laughs> I told him my name is Joe Dalton, and he calling me David, so I, I didn't correct him. And uh, he's saying David this and David that, and we're just rolling with David, amen? And so uh, then he looked at me, he said, David, he said, what are you gonna do with your life? David, what are you gonna do with your life? And I probably said, Dr. Boyd, let me show you my milk and muscle. And I said, my daddy's a preacher, my brother's a preacher, somebody's gotta make a living. And you know, we laughed and everything, but Brother Boyd went on down the road and the revival meeting finished and somebody else started talking to me. And that was the Lord. And the Lord said, J.D., and he he knew my name. (laughs) And he said, why don't you go beyond what you want to do and what you want to be? And by this time, I had 92 Holstein heifers, y'all, and I got 15 of them bred, and I've got a a line of credit established, a production credit association. I've gone to school to learn how to artificially inseminate cows and how to palpate cows, how to pregnancy check cows. I'm consumed with being a dairy farmer. The only problem is is that my script and God's script was two different things. Are you listening to me? Say, what'd you do? It didn't take me very long to decide, Lord, I love you more than all the cows in Texas. If you want me to Follow you, Lord. I I just, I love you more, Lord. I love you more than anything. Are you listening to me? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Man, I started going after God. Are you listening to me? I started going after God. And the next scene was Deanna, my wife and I, we was at Johnson County Dairy Sale in Cleburne, Texas. And we sold those 92 Holstein heifers. And I just said, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go and I'll be what you want me to be. And God called me to preach. And so now instead of chasing cows across Texas, I'm chasing sinners across Arkansas. And all these pastors would agree, we got a lot of job security, don't we? We do, we got a lot of job security. Wow, 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 wow. I surrendered to preach. Worked with my dad for five and a half years and got some good experience working with my dad. And then we loaded up the truck and we moved to El Dorado, Arkansas. And started our church in our home with 14 people. And wow. It's been unbelievable, y'all. It's unbelievable what God's done. Amen. We got 23 acres now. We got nine men that are out of our church that are pastoring. We got a Christian school, supporting missionaries all over the world. Amen. Run the buses, got jail ministry, got prison ministry. We got a lot of hooks in the water. Are you listening to me? I love serving Jesus. 
Songwriter said, if I had a thousand lives to live, I'd live them all for my Lord. He's been so good to me, it's the least I could afford. He's made the good times out of the bad. He's been the best friend I ever had. Just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We moved to El Dorado. My oldest son, Joe, was nine years old, and my, or 11 years old, and my daughter, Janine, was nine, and my, my little uh, boy, Jake, was five, and Jenna was two. My baby was two. And the last two are both redheaded, Jake and Jenna redheaded. I don't know where they got that from. And uh, I tell people now that my wife married me for the waves, and now she's getting the beach, amen? <laughs> and, uh, oh, yeah, it happens, amen? Yeah, she got it. She finally got it. She was processing there, and it, it, it clicked. Okay, good. So we got to El Dorado, and we're unloading everything. You know, we're moving our stuff, and... And my wife grew up riding horses and country girl and, you know, we loved, she played volleyball and stuff at our Christian school. And we met in our Christian school. Her grandpa was a pastor and my dad was our pastor. And Well, anyway, uh, she's strong, you know, we're both young and strong. And, but my wife said uh, her back, something happened in her back and, and, and it got bad, y'all. It got real bad, her back. And I had to put my, my arms under her arms and help her get to the bathroom and it was rough, and you know, we're young and strong, and then this happened. Next thing you know, we're at Baptist Medical, and Wilbur Giles, the back surgeon there's cutting on my wife, and they're wheeling her down the aisle. I mean, I got, I've been to hospitals and making visits, but my wife, you know, I mean, I got a lump in my throat and tears in my eyes because I knew they were going to be cutting on her, and I had to get my old script out again. It wasn't in my script that my wife would have an inherited back disease, a deterioration, a degeneration of the disc in her neck and her back and they've had to go through her throat and do surgery and her back, her low back and all that. She's been through a lot of stuff, a lot of health issues, a lot, a lot of procedures. Yeah. At one time we owed like 27 different entities, you know how that goes, it's a lot of hospital stuff. And we had insurance and all that, but still, I mean, 20% of a whole bunch of stuff is still a lot of money. My wife, ladies, had that where she had fibroid cyst and she'd get fluid on cyst and she would have to go to the doctor and get that fluid drained off. And she was kind of acclimated to that from time to time. Uh, it would just happen and she would go get the fluid drained. But one day she had a, a, a cyst that it was hard to the touch. It was different. And she told me about it. And then so went to the doctor and they biopsied it, came back that my wife had breast cancer. And uh, we were at my oldest grandson's 10th birthday party, and I'm real tender-hearted. My wife's not like that. She's not hard-hearted, but she's not like me. And uh, we were there with all the grandkids and having a birthday party, and, and I'm sitting on the couch or recliner or whatever, and she comes up, and tears are going down her cheeks, and she got her back to everybody else because she's not like that. She don't want them to see her. And I look up at her, and tears are going down. I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? And she said, what if this is the last birthday party that I get to come to? She was just kind of processing, you know, just, I just want the cancer out of my body. That's what she'd say. And so they did the cancer, the surgery, and, and then the radiation she'd have to stop because the radiation was burning her, 30 radiation treatments. She'd have to stop to let her body kind of cool off and go right back on it again. She got those 30 radiation treatments done and then they started trying different cancer medicines kind of to follow up and she just couldn't, they made her so sick. I mean, those medicines are bad, y'all. The side effects to those cancer medicines are bad. Yeah. Yeah. The only one that she could tolerate was called tamoxifen. Tamoxifen. And they found out that her cancer was feeding off of estrogen and progesterone. And, and so um, they gave her that tamo tamoxifen and and just basically uh, stopped her body from producing what the cancer was feeding off of. And I say to the glory of God, she's been cancer-free now for 13 years. Amen. But during that time, are you listening to me? During that time, we had to... We had to get our script out. We're good people. My wife's not a wicked heifer. She's a good godly lady, a good pastor's wife. She loves the Lord and loves me and loves God. I mean, it's a blessing. She's a good one. I'm married up. But we've just been through a lot of stuff. Are you yeah. listening to me? We've been through a lot of stuff. Yeah. 
We got combat experience. Yeah. While we're here at the Old Timers Conference. Yeah. I thought Old Timer was a pocket knife. Amen. <laughs> I didn't know I are one. Amen. Yeah. Wow. It wasn't in my script that, that I would get prostate cancer. Huh. I had to go to Delray Beach, Florida last year in February and have a four hour surgery and Wow, wow, five weeks of catheters, five catheters, man, it's brutal. The people were praying, preacher, thanks for praying for me. Yes. Somebody went and got God for me. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Somebody prayed for me. Excellent. Are you listening to me? Amen. Amen. During COVID, my oldest daughter, Janine, you know how sometimes you you got your children and your family's kind of coming along and then maybe kind of real late in your life, so to speak, uh, she got pregnant. And it was unexpected, but she, the, you know, she got pregnant. And wow, we was all excited. And she got, a, a, her oldest son's in Bible college and she's pregnant. Lordy mercy. Well, during COVID, my oldest daughter, I had a little baby named Avonlea Ray. And little Avonlea didn't make it. Little Avonlea Ray Mullinax didn't make it. Brother Floyd, we went to had one of the little baby caskets, and my daughter was a basket case. We just had this, us, my wife and I, and the funeral director, Brother JT, went out there on 335, the little cemetery. We buried our little granddaughter. We knew she was in heaven. We knew she was safe. But it wasn't in our script. My father's way may twist and turn. My heart may throb and ache. But in my soul, I'm glad I know he maketh no mistakes. God don't make no mistakes. But sometimes we're human and we're frail and we're fragile and we misinterpret what God allows to happen and people get bitter. People get bitter and they blame God. I don't know where you're at tonight. Psalm 62, 5 says, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. Oh, listen, I don't know, y'all. I don't know. But I know the one who does know. And I'm just going to tell you tonight, I've had to get my script out. Over and over again, when my mama died at the age of 56, I mean, you know, the only thing, we could have tag team preaching, the only thing that makes the sermon longer is just illustrations of things that we've all been through in our lives that weren't in our script. But God allowed it to happen. The title of the message tonight is Tear Up the Script. Tear Up the Script. Tear Up the Script. Bitterness always destroys its container. Let all bitterness and wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. And be kind one to another, yeah. tender hearted, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Amen. I think it'd be good tonight just to gather around the altar and say, wow, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. It'd be good tonight if we could kind of get a fresh glimpse of him and leave this place looking for those that are looking for redemption. Yeah. Yeah. Are you with me? Let me have the, who's going to do the invitation? Well, like, could you come play the piano softly? That'd be good. Well, someone said the, it's good to be in the Lord's house when he's home. It's good to be in the Lord's house when he's home. I've often said the time to do business with God is when God is doing business with you. I think it'd be good you come on down to the altar, you pray in your seat, whatever you feel led to do. We're not counting noses, but you come to the house of God, you come to a meeting like this, you come to get some help. You come to get some help. God's sure been good, hasn't he, Brother JT? God's been good to us. Oh, wow, God's been so good. Could have thumped me off into hell, let me pay for my own dirty right to sin, but he didn't do that. He reached way down for me, amen. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me, amen. He came to me. 
Man, what a blessing. I'm glad I ain't going to hell no more. If you need some help, preachers here. Oh, I tell you, I just, wow. So, well, preacher, what you do? What do you do? And somebody loses a little baby, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I just cry with them, amen. We just weep with them and love them. I don't understand. I don't, there's a lot, so many things have happened I didn't understand. But God allowed it to happen. But if you'll give your circumstances back to God, well, if you'll give it back to Him, He'll turn around and bring people into your life that you can help because you, you've been through that. Well, I've taken the comfort. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. And I've taken that comfort that God comforted my heart with when my mama went home to be with the Lord at the age of 56. And I've, I've used that comfort that he comforted my heart with to comfort the hearts of others who lost their mama. God didn't make no mistake. No, he was equipping me to be able to help somebody else. God's equipped you. Some of your mamas who've been through some stuff. And you hear about a young mama that's going through something. You know my daughter that lost that little baby. Miss Loretta, I'm so proud of Janine because Janine has helped a lot of other young mamas who've lost little babies. And, I, you know, I don't know how to do that. I haven't been through what those young mamas have been through. But my daughter, God, has equipped her to be able to help them. And she's using, she's using what God allowed to happen to help somebody else. And when you do that, you begin to see, wow, God knew exactly what he was doing. He was equipping me to be able to help somebody else that was going to be going through what I've already been through. When somebody tells me, would you pray for me, Pastor? I've got breast cancer. I, 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 I tell my wife, I'll tell my wife, my wife knows how to pray for you. My wife will pray for you. She loves you. And wow, it's been a blessing, y'all. It's been a real blessing. God doesn't make any mistakes. He's in control of everything. your heads bowed and your eyes closed tonight let me just ask let me ask you a couple questions with your heads bowed I know all of us here every single one of us in this auditorium tonight have gone gone through something and maybe you haven't torn up your script maybe you've let your challenges get the best of you can I tell you all tonight we don't understand we don't understand why we have to go through the challenges that we go through. God has a plan. God has a plan. I hope tonight that you'll tear up your script. And you'll let God use you through whatever your challenge is in life. Take whatever God's allowed to come to you and use it for the glory of God. Nobody's going to get out of this thing without a challenge. I've said it many times that the world out there that doesn't know Christ, the world is full of people that are going through challenges just like you go through challenges. The difference between you and them and me and them is we have the Lord to go through it with us. They don't. Wow. Tonight we ought to thank God that we have the Lord to go through our challenges with us. Please listen to this question. Maybe there's somebody here tonight 
please be honest with yourself and honest with God. Maybe you are not 100% for sure that if you died today that you'd go to heaven. Would you be honest and just say, preacher, I don't know. I'm not certain of that. I, I am really not 100% for sure. I feel like I might be. I, I feel like I'm 70, 80% for sure, maybe even 90%, but I'm not 100% for sure tonight. Preacher, please pray for me. Would you quietly slip your hand up? I'm not certain of my eternity. Please pray for me tonight, preacher. Is there anybody like that? You'd say, preacher, I'm not sure of my eternity. Is there anybody like that here tonight? I don't know if I die today, I go to heaven. Is there anybody like that tonight? I don't know that, preacher. Would you slip your hand up right now? I'll not point you out, not call your name. How about this? Just as a, as a testimony, you'd say, preacher, I do know. Without a doubt in my mind that if I die today, I know for certain I'd go to heaven. Quiet testimony. Would you slip your hand up? Preacher, I know that. I know for sure I'm on my way to heaven. God bless you. Thank you. You can put them down. Maybe there's somebody here tonight that you couldn't raise your hand to say, I do know. God wants you to know that more than anything. God wants you to know that. Oh, tonight, if you don't know, there's still time that you can step out of your seat. There are men down here. We, we could have a lady show you. If you don't know for sure that heaven is your home, you can step out right now. Just step out of your seat right now. Tonight, why don't we take this message and let it change our life to know that we're all going to go through something. But when we do, know this, that God is in control and he has a plan. And let's glorify. Let's choose tonight that we're going to glorify God through whatever we go through from this day forward. We can either get better, and, and, and he said this, we can get bitter, we can get better. And bitterness only destroys the container that it's housed in. And you can let that bitterness eat you up, and it can destroy you from the inside out. Or you can turn it over, you can turn your challenge, you can turn, turn your trouble, your heartache and your heartbreak over to God. It's up to you. Why don't we turn it over to God tonight? I truly believe that God sent Pastor Weedo here tonight to preach that message for us. It wasn't an accident. I know I needed it. I know I needed it. And I believe everybody else here did as well. Heavenly Father, tonight we thank you for the message and the messenger tonight. Lord, thank you, God, that each time that he and his family have gone through something, they have torn up their script and kept going. And I pray, God, that we'll go thou and do likewise. Help us, Lord, to stay in the fight and keep going for Christ's sake and for others' sake, dear God, that need the gospel out there that are waiting on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.